Well, um, good afternoon, evening, morning, depending on where in the world you are right now, to our uh, fourth Octoprint on Air hangout for the awesome patrons on Patreon. Um, yeah, uh, I'm still trying to get a bit used to uh, to my new setup that I have here, which hopefully will lead to me more looking more into the camera than usual so far. Um, I hope that's working fine. And uh, also the new um, video software stuff that I'm using now that I've moved over to using YouTube live events. The reason for that, uh, if you're wondering why I'm not just doing another Hangout on Air like I used to do, is simply that... Um, uh, Google decided to basically move over the Hangout on Air stuff to, to YouTube Live and starting this, uh, September 16th, I think they will enforce that. And I thought, well, I probably should get used to that rather sooner than later. So I figured let's just do the next, um, uh, the next on air event directly on YouTube Live. Um, the big advantage of that is that we now also have a live chat, which on the YouTube page you should be finding somewhere down here. Uh, you can also pop that out in a separate window, which is what I have been done. Uh, I have done here. So if you see me looking towards there, that's because I'm glancing at the chat and looking at what you're typing there. Um, I also hope that uh, we get some nice interaction going that way. What we do not have any longer, sadly, is this this uh, little Q and A widget system thingy that is built into Hangouts on Air, which we used in the last three um, episodes. So if you have any questions, just write them in the chat and I'll try to um, get to them. I hope I see them scroll by. So maybe just don't type too much. Um, otherwise you might be faster than I can read while also talking to you. Um, and other than that, I think that's all I have to say for now for the, for the housekeeping kind of welcome stuff. And, um, I guess we can just get started now. So, um, basically what have I been up to since the last time we saw each other? Well, uh, I've been working on some bug fixes and improvements for one to 15. Uh, basically what which uh, what what will turn into one to sixteen um stuff like I don't know if you remember last time I mentioned uh, during my little print time estimation rent that uh there was still a little bug in there which made this this dump estimate which tells you that stuff will take days to finish right at the very beginning and which I actually had code in to suppress at the very beginning because usually that estimate is wide out of um, anything sensible. Um, so basically I wanted to keep this undercover for something like 30 minutes or so before I fell back to the dump estimate if I, uh, uh, if I not, if I did not have anything better until then, but instead of 30 minutes, it was something like 30, 30 seconds. So right from the beginning, you got this garbage output, um, in, uh, and which told you just something like, like six days or seven days when you did not have, uh, uh other um, other estimate bases. Uh, watch the watch the last episode if you need details on on what other uh, stuff might be available. But anyway, um, this is something that I fixed. Uh, also, there was or there have been report, uh, repeated issues with people who copy files right into the uploads folder of Octoprint, um, which is something I would not recommend because Octoprint is doing some little bit of its own housekeeping here and there, and it is also sanitizing the file names so they don't cause any troubles via HTTP and all that. And if you copy stuff in there, then you basically circumvent this. But starting with one, uh, one to 16, you will be able to nevertheless copy stuff in there because if Octoprint stumbles across any files that it does, that do not uh, match its sanitization uh, standards, it will simply rename them. So this is also something that I built in order to stop weird things from happening to people which uh, copy stuff directly in the upload folder. If you're wondering now, if I'm not supposed to copy stuff, 
stuff directly into the uploads folder? Is, is, is there another way to just, I don't know, SCP or FTP files over to my Octoprint instance in just, uh, in, instead of always having to go through the, um, the web interface? And yes, there is. It's called the watched folder and it's uh, configured uh, under settings folders, right, with all the other folders. And this is a folder where uh, every file you copy in, it will directly uh, get moved uh, into Octoprint by Octoprint, just as if you had uploaded it through the UI. So if you want to mount some folder as a network share in order to quickly um, move files over to Octoprint, then this is the, f uh, the the folder that you should be using, please, instead of the uploads folder. But again, in 1 to 16, even if you do uh, use the uploads folder, hopefully stuff will not break anymore by that. Um, you might also remember that we had a little uh, issue with 1214, which uh, caused a lot of new gray hairs on my head uh, and which led to the release of 1215, something like 48 hours after 1214 got pushed out of the door. And back then I said in order to um, prevent something from that uh, from happening again, I would be looking into um, something like a beta uh, release um, channel kind of thing. And this is also something that I uh, worked on and implemented, and it's working quite nicely. Um, I based it on GitHub pre-releases and on which branches those pre-releases were declared. So we do not have any additional servers or stuff like that that need to be in place and which could get down or something. Um, but it just relies on GitHub's infrastructure. Of course, if this goes down, we have completely different problems. Anyhow, um, I thought maybe I could show you um, quickly how this stuff now looks, where you can find it starting with 1.2.16, um, which is not out yet. I'll get to that in a, in a bit. And um, yeah, so let's try switching to my screen uh, over there. I hope this worked. And um, I have an Octoprint instance here, which is running the current maintenance branch, uh, 1.2.16 dev 28. And uh, if there you go into the settings and go into software update and there into the software update settings that hide behind this little wrench button in the upper right corner. Um, currently it's set here to com uh, commit tracking. Uh, your regular uh, run of the mill Octopi is usually set to release tracking here. And uh, there you have this new uh, this new drop down here where you can select between the stable release channel, which is uh, basically all the stable releases that so far were the, the, the only releases that you can could get through the software update plugin um, directly. And uh, also you can choose the maintenance release candidates, which is basically what uh, 1 to 16 should be considered at this point. And also uh, currently there is nothing behind this here. But uh, what I also want to pull out there are um, the devil release candidates. So basically stuff that is on the devil branch and is getting slowly but uh, steadily ready to, to get merged into the stable branch and hence uh, finally released for good. So basically, if you want to take a sneak peek at 1.3.0 functionality in the future, as soon as I put a release candidate out for 1.3.0, this is where you will find it. Now. On this Octopi instance here, I mocked a bit um, the various uh, some, some some releases on those channels by um, with a custom plugin. The details are not that important. However, if I uh, let's say let's say I, I select the maintenance RC and say self uh, safe, then you will say see here the update available notification for one two sixteen RC two, and um, also you see this nice little reminder that I am on the maintenance branch and should hence not really be tracking releases, but I am anyhow. Um, if I were to switch over to the Devil RC's uh, release channel, then I would see, hey, nice, there are uh, there is a 1.3.0 RC1. And uh, likewise, if I decided uh, I don't like um, uh, sorry, I don't like those those RC's anymore, I want to go back to stable. Um, you could also do that by just uh, switching back to the stable release channel. And what it will also do is take care of um, 
um, not only updating to new versions from the pre-releases, but also to downgrade you uh, back to uh, earlier versions from the other channels. So basically, if you switch from the maintenance or from the development um, uh, RC channel back to the stable channel, it will downgrade to the stable version again. It will take care of all the Git branch changes in the background for you while doing that and also of resetting everything. So that should hopefully work out. I've tested this a lot on the current Octopi image. I still intend to give this some more testing um, before I released 1.2.16. But uh, in general, if you want to play around with it and feel comfortable with uh, with uh, with git uh, uh, branch switching the instructions on how to do that stuff are actually on the octoprint wiki so um you can you are you, are, uh, you can just um play around with 1 to 16 as well now um although of course um admittedly without uh, without uh, um mocking any releases that uh, will that that release channel thing will not do a lot of stuff for you Anyhow, let me quickly change that back. Okay, so um, speaking of uh, the development version, I was also working a lot on that again. Thankfully, I finally found the time to get back to that and, 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 and did not spend the whole month just um, with, with maintenance overhead. Um, Turned out I still had a little bug concerning folders there. And uh, even though I, I thought I had ironed them, them all out last month, uh, but, but I found it and I fixed that one as well. And uh, something that has come up repeatedly is uh, reports of people who um, observed uh, um, a CPU spike, CPU usage spikes on their, on their RPIs when accessing the web page, reloading the, it in, in, the, in the browser, maybe because they're checking in on the print in the middle of a, a multi-hour print. And while the most problematic um, cases of that seem to have been caused by the history plugin, actually, and not Octoprint itself, uh, I took the opportunity to look a bit into Octoprint's API endpoints. So the main page that you load, so that pure HTML stuff that you load into your browser, that, that one is already has been cached now since, I think I, I put that already out with 1.2.0, um, but all the API endpoints, so something like give me your files, give me your, uh, your uploaded files, give me your time-lapse files, give me your log files, stuff like that was not cached yet. And the problem is that for whatever reason, um, traversing through uh, a lot of files and, and just collecting the names, the sizes and, and, and so metadata like that, not the actual contents, depending on how many you have and what generation of Raspberry Pi you have. And even on a, on a more powerful machine, this can t take quite a while and this keeps the machine quite busy. So um, caching that has the certain advantage that you can just fetch the data from the cache and do not have to iterate over all the stuff uh, on, on, on disk anymore. Disadvantage of that, of course, is that you have to find a way to make sure that you are not using stale uh, contents from the cache when the data has updated. And uh, I think I found a way to solve this by doing a very quick scan over the, over the change times of the folders uh, and the metadata folder of Octoprint. Um, instead of iterating over every file and trying to figure out if it's a modification date changed. And this seems to work quite nicely. And uh, yeah, so I use the same mechanics, mechanics. Ugh. I'm having a bit of trouble talking today, sorry. Um, uh, also for the time lapse and the locks endpoints and also a bunch of other stuff. So basically I went through the whole API and uh, introduced some uh, server-side caching and client-side caching headers where they made sense and uh, in a way that they made sense. And um, I initially had the idea to also do this directly on the maintenance branch and make it available with 1.2.16. But once I got started, I uh, found out this stuff is, is just too invasive with too big of a chain, uh, chance to have uh, bugs creep in. Um, especially because of the, the problem where you have to make sure that the cache is not stale and all that. And so I um, 
decided to do that on Devil so that it uh, there is uh, still some more testing time for it. So you're surprisingly silent in the chat. Um, I'm not sure if this is a good sign or a bad sign. <laughs> um, I just hope that it is not a uh, not a big problem. Anyhow, um, yeah, uh, while doing that, um, that that stuff with the with the caching, I uh, I ran into something that I'm still not sure whether it's a jQuery bug or an HTTP, uh, sorry, or a browser bug because it occurred sim di di differently in Firefox and Chrome and. But um, what, what, wherever that bug may be located, and it definitely was not in my code, uh, because I did a minimal example and it still occurred, um, it cost me nearly two days, I think, trying to figure out why Octoprint's core UI suddenly was not properly loading anymore after I introduced the, the client caching headers. And... Um, I don't want to bore you too much with the details. Um, there is a there is a link to a minimal uh, a minimal example with which to reproduce that stuff uh, in the in the commit, um, with which I fixed at least my problem, even though it only was a workaround for the bug. I just wanted to mention it here quickly because it's really surprising how stuff like like something simple as that you basically add caching headers to to responses and expect everything to work and suddenly stuff breaks in a completely different direction and then you you think oh god i broke everything and you spend hours trying to fix your code and then in the end you figure out oh it wasn't me so i don't know this is really stuff that costs me me hours or days it's horrible yeah the usual uh, the usual day of a, of a developer i guess um so um, after I, I dove up again from the from the etag headers and uh, all the other client caching related stuff, I also um, yeah I spent a lot of time again on writing documentation, 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 um, and uh, this is also actually something that is one of three points I think that is still keeping me from uh, making a first release candidate for one three zero. Because while I'm writing the documentation, I usually uh, I, I usually think about I, a lot about how stuff is working and why stuff is working the way it is when I'm trying to describe why it is working like it is. And then I find uh, places where stuff is working not really good <laughs> because the API design is wonky or the architecture is wonky. And um, yeah, so so documentation usually also leads to fixes, and usually those are um, backwards incompatible fixes. So um, I'm trying to do a full co documentation run over the whole code base uh, that was changed, at least to make sure that I um, do not introduce horrible things into the versions that are released that I cannot uh, roll back on ever again because of uh, compatibility. Yeah. Um, oh, and we just talked about horrible, weird bugs. Um, I'm currently fighting with cookie headers. So the last one and a half days, I think, I spent on... Um, there was a bug reported, uh, which must have been in there for three years or more, and nobody ever reported it to me, and I did not ever run into it myself, that if you have uh, one, uh, two or more Octoprint instances running on the same host, but on different ports, and then lock in or out of one, then you also also get locked uh, in uh, out of the other, and that was caused by um, basically what I learned um, is that cookies are not port sensitive, and Octoprint tracks your lock in session via a cookie it sets on your on your browser. And so the one instance set its cookie with its name session and the other instance set its uh, different cookie with the name session and therefore that this one overrode that one and then stuff didn't work anymore. So I thought, hey, it's not too difficult to solve this. We just introduce um, port specific uh, cookie names. So I rewrote the HTTP processing stuff in Octoprint to basically um, postfix any uh, cookies that Octoprint uh, has to set this also includes stuff that would be set from plugins, so this way it's uh, completely transparent for, for plugin developers as well. Um, 
basically postfix them with something that is specific to the user's part. And when I went to testing this, I ran into weird session stuff. So I don't know yet what is going on there, but uh, I guess I have my work, work cut out for me uh, come Monday. And I already know that I will once again have to fight cookies. Yay. Um, uh, thank God it's Saturday only so far. Um, yeah. Anyhow, um, once I have this thing figured out, this uh, leads us to the, the plans for the nearby future. I want to uh, put out um, a release candidate of 1 to 16. The problem, of course, is that in order to subscribe to release candidates, you would need 1 to 16 to already be installed. So this is the only release candidate that I'll put out for maintenance release. Uh, for which people will have to install it manually if they want to test it. I sincerely hope some of you will do that because, um, as I said last time, it helps really a lot if you report back on the stability of release candidates uh, before they make it into a proper release. Because if there are any problems that I cannot reproduce here, because I simply cannot have every combination of uh, printer hardware, software and firmware on the planet, um, it really helps to, to, to iron that out before stuff hits the mainstream. Um, while I'll wait for re test reports on 1 to 16, once I've put out that release candidate, I'll also continue my documentation spree throughout the devil branch. And uh, I hope that I will soon get to a point where I really be, uh, feel quite happy with the current state of it, because right now I'm still very unsure about some parts where which I also have not visit, revisited yet uh, with within my documentation spree um, regarding how they are implemented right now and if this is the best way to do it so I have to take another look at that but uh, in general uh, what is what is still missing in in 130 to keep it from release is the dimension documentation run um, some more tests of the changes of uh, the the pip integration that I did. So basically when you're installing plugins or, or updating Octoprint itself, Octoprint is calling uh, this, this little nifty tool called pip for you. And pip has a number of interesting uh, parameters, like also the ability to install locally for the user instead of globally for the system. If Octoprint happens to be running from a non-writable location and I implemented stuff that would detect that and then try to uh, installed for the user instead of globally, which would fail because Octoprint is not allowed to do that. And um, these are things that are a bit tricky to test because you have to roll back every time and then start again. And uh, yeah, not a lot of fun. And uh, something that I really fear is I also have to write the change log for 130, which admittedly I should have done while working on all the stuff that is in there because then I would not now have to spend hours going through the Git repository trying to figure out what I put in there. But once that stuff is done, I guess it's time for the for first RC. Um, okay, so that was what I've been working on and what I plan to be working on, um, which brings us to the next point, questions and answers. So uh, a bunch of you people sent me uh, a handful of questions uh, uh, before this uh, this broadcast started um, by mail and uh, on the on the Google Plus event. And um, first question is um, in the G Code viewer, is it possible to save checkbox states from the render options? Center viewport on model show next layer and so on. So. This is actually uh, a feature request on the Octoprint GitHub and that has been open for a while now. And I have to say, sorry, it is not yet possible. I have not come around to it. If anyone wants to give it a shot, it is probably not that tricky to pull off, especially if you basically just take a look at how the um, checkbox saving stuff per user or per browser session is already done for, for other parts of the system. I simply think that I should concentrate on stuff that is more, um, yeah, important is maybe the wrong word, but basically uh, the, 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 a bit more tricky to, to handle stuff for now um, in order to get these two versions out uh, instead of 
adding one stuff, one 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 more feature and then one more feature and then one more feature. So basically, currently I'm considering one three O in a in a feature freeze. Um, I think this specific feature, uh, the G Code Viewer uh, checkbox state stuff, is actually one of the feature requests that are even marked as up for grabs on the uh, on the Octoprint uh, issue tracker. So if you want to give it a try, feel free. Um, then another question about the G Code Viewer. Um, I'm curious about the G Code Viewer. It is a significant burden on browsers when it is very large. I guess when the G Code file is very large. Can it be optimized to retrieve only the layers needed for display in real time, or does it do this already? It doesn't do this already, and the reason why it is such a burden on the client is basically that I made it intentionally in a way or rather I made the, integ the, the integration between the G-Code viewer, which was an existing module um, with Octoprint, was made in a, in, a, in a way that keeps as much strain from the server as possible. So the idea here is that if you have Octoprint running on something like a Raspberry Pi 1, um, you Chances are high that thing will be pretty, pretty busy with uh, with pushing uh, data over to your printer. So you do not want to have it also uh, constantly have to answer requests from more than one, maybe even browsers trying to keep up in the G-Code viewer with parts that are being printed right now, because then you would basically have it um, yeah, under a lot of stress. So input from this side and this from I mean, just just imagine sitting in trying to work yeah in in an office in an open office space and then people your, your colleagues constantly saying hey, can you please and can you please and can you please and this is the same situation just for the raspberry pi and so the g code viewer is written such that it pulls down the full file from the uh, server holds it in memory and this is of course something that is very resource intensive which is also why there is this dialogue thing in in place which stops you from trying to run the g code viewer on files that might make your browser crash and um, once it has it in memory it then parses it and then displays it it might be possible um, and this is something that i think there also rec there also exists uh, um, um, a feature request for somewhere in the tracker um, to basically have this this internal structure that the G code viewer generates from the G code file. So basically, the parse the, the output of the parsing, um, which is uh, these and these layers, uh, and and they are contain these and these movements. And those movements were extruding or retracting or just movements without anything like that. This stuff could maybe be persisted on the server, maybe even generated by the server, I don't know, once during the G-code analysis where that thing uh, goes through the whole um, G-code file anyhow and interprets it. So, so this would be an option. And something is humming here and just driving me nuts, sorry. And uh, this would... Um, this, this would be interesting to look into uh, and I'll try to, to remember it. I can't, cannot promise, sadly, right now, though, when I find the time to get around to that. Um, in general, though, uh, everything in Octoprint is focused on keeping the server as unloaded by the connecting clients as possible. Um, and the G Code Viewer is one example of put, putting this to the extreme, basically. Um, Okay, so the next question is, um, could you show us how to create a Cura slicing profile and why the most important settings cannot be adjusted before the slicing so that I have to upload multiple profiles files? Profile files, tricky thing. Is Cura slicer the only slicer that's working with Octoprint? So, okay, so this is actually three parts. Let us start with part one. So how to uh, create a Cura slicing profile. Basically what you do, is in Cura and Cura 1504 I have to say here because this is the only versions of Cura so anything below 1504 that Octoprint currently supports um, because the engine also changed a lot. What you can do in Cura 1504 still is this little thing here file save profile and this will save those exact, exact any files that Octoprint wants. Um, 
uh, for its Cura in implementation too. So if you if you change the infill setting to 10% here and then say save profile, and uh, there I wanted to go, and then you say something like sum profile 10 infill, then it will save that. Then you can go into Cura engine settings in Octoprint, say import profile, browse there, import it, confirm, and there it is, your shiny new profile freshly imported. And um, you can also use it directly here. So why is it this complicated and why is there not an editor um, inside of Octoprint to do that? Basically because I didn't write one. And the reason for that is that um, everything you see there in the part with the slicing dialog currently is um, created in a way that it is possible to hook any slicer into Octoprint as long as someone writes a plugin for that. For some reason, uh, the only uh, slicing plugin which does actually reliably work <laughs> is the Cura engine plugin directly bundled into Octoprint. I started on a slice 3R plugin uh, a while back. The thing is that I um had some issues with that um with with weird return codes from the binary itself when calling it which indicated that stuff failed when in fact it didn't and i um after fumbling around with that for a couple of days i, I didn't find the time anymore to look into it because other stuff was 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 uh, basically burning in my back um but the code is there people can uh, work on it if they want and the documentation on how to implement other slicers or integrate other slicers into Octoprint is there too. So if you consider now that there is support in place for more than one slicer engine and that Octoprint is supposed to work with basically everything that you can write a plugin for, then I hope it becomes somewhat clear why the dialogue currently does not offer these options because they are completely named differently per slicer and the profiles are structured differently per slicer and everything is differently per slicer because there's no standard for that kind of thing. Um, still doesn't excuse the lack of a way to maybe at least change the infill uh, volume, uh, the infill percentage or the parameter count or the filament diameter or whatever you, uh, you may want. The thing is, you don't want to overload the, the dialog either. You have to think of what are the most important settings anyhow, which depends again on uh, every user's workflow and on, sorry, and on every, um, on every individual slicer. So it is very tricky to do that kind of dialog in a way that it doesn't get into your way. And considering how much work that is and um, Octoprint, not actually being a slicer, but a whole piece of host software. I had a bit of, pro, uh, of, of, of trouble so far justifying the amount of work I'd have to put into that. That doesn't mean that it will never be in there. In fact, it is something that I want to see in there. But so far, I did not find the time. If anyone wants to try their hand on it, be my guest. It might even be possible to do that by a plugin right now, just basically building a little uh, profile editor or something like that, or replacing the slicing dialog or, or adding a different one or whatever. Um, yeah, I just have to be careful that I do not spend um, extraordinarily amount of time on features that are not the main um, yeah, not the main focus of Octoprint. I, I personally, what I would like to see more is not Octoprint trying to integrate other slices and trying to um, get them to do the slicing job and doing everything else that a slicer is usually supposed to allow, like rotating a model and I don't know, maybe even um, um, cutting it through and stuff like that, resizing and all that. Um, this is not really something I think that a host uh, host's main uh, focus should be. And instead of 
trying to get Octoprint to do all of that, what I, what I would rather see, what I would rather like to see, is more slicers integrating with Octoprint because we have an upload API for uploading G-code. It is documented and uh, Sly, uh, Slice 3R is actually already doing that. So the current versions there, you can, you can just um, uh, configure your Octoprint uh, instance only one though, but hey, <laughs> um, uh, and and it will upload the sliced files automatically there. And I think you can even tell it to immediately start printing. So stuff like that, I think, is is something that is more fitting to the actual workflow. Because even even if I make the the dialogues or the the integration of uh, slicers in Octoprint as sophisticated as possible, this is still a web oh, uh, a, a, a web. A browser interface kind of thingy that is supposed to run fast and and also ideally ideally run on mobile devices in one way or another and i'm not so sure that i will ever be able to allow everything that is possible in slicers uh, in in the uis of common slicers in octoprint and i'm also not sure if i want to do that because again this is a piece of host software it is not a slicer a slicer is good if you want to slice things and host software is good if you want to print things. Octoprint does a bit of an integration trying to help you if you just want to quickly print something which is already orientated in the, in the correct direction with a, with a stock profile which you are happy with and basically if you just want to automate stuff this is working great. If you want to individually adjust each and every file that you print use the tool that was made for that. And do not expect Octoprint to turn into a one fit, uh, one fit uh, solution for that. I mean, again, there is a plugin interface. If people want to do that, be my guest. I just don't want to overload it too much with slicer integration stuff. Uh, and, and in the meantime, uh, have the actual core use case, uh, usage, usage scenarios for it, mainly printing things fall out. This would be bad, I think. And I also have gotten um, some complaints already from users <laughs> when I released 1.2.0, which basically went like, why was there such a focus on, on slicer integration when all I want to do is print already sliced G-code files? And yeah, I mean, I, I see the point. So, okay. Um, Next question. Uh, another question. Is it planned for the future to support a diamond hot end for full color printing and how extensive are the necessary changes for it? So I took a look at what the diamond hot end actually is because I heard the name, but I didn't really look into it in the past couple of weeks. And um, actually, I would be surprised if there were changes necessary with an octoprint at all because octoprint has been uh, capable of a multi extruder printing basically since ever um, bas but because Octoprint is not a slicer again it's just a piece of host software so uh, if you have g-code that uses uh, or that is sliced for usage with a diamond hot end I don't see why there would be a problem streaming that g-code via Octoprint to your printer equipped with said diamond hot end um, also do not think that there would be any problem with the temperature graph. I mean, um, the only thing that would maybe be a bit weird is that Octoprint currently assumes that when you have more than one extruder, you also have more than one uh, actual hot end. So you not only get, when you configure more than one extruder, you not only get more uh, tools to, to be selected in the control tab for extrude and retract commands that you manually send to it, but you also get more temperature curves, uh, curves in, the, in the temperature graph. And um, so what I could imagine, but I do not know exactly how uh, diamond hot end support is implemented in the various firmwares that are out there is that you would need something like uh, need to have I don't know three temperature curves there and two of them would just get stuck at zero or so because the firmware would not report anything back for them because actually there would only be one hot end and three extruders um, but I don't see why that would keep you from actually utilizing your diamond hot end with Octoprint of course, uh, if anyone has any uh, experiences with running this, uh, these things from Octoprint, um, 
and went into into any problems, I'm I'm happy to look into any reports that I get. But so far, I haven't heard anything um, that would indicate that Octoprint would not be compatible to uh, filament mixing nozzles uh, like the Diamond Hot End. So um, that were all of the questions that I got at the very beginning before the the thingy here started. Um, I'm not seeing anything more right now in the chat, which has been very silent. I really hope you people are still there because otherwise I would now have spent 45 minutes talking to myself, which is a bit weird. Um, so um, one thing not actually that was not not actually a question relating to Octoprint, but which nevertheless was requested um, by several people uh, before this broadcast started was the question as to how to how the heck to pronounce my last name. So I thought I would not only tell you how to pronounce my last name, but um, I would also tell you why there is a B in there or if there even is a B in there. Anyhow, um, first let's start. My, my last name is Heuske. Heuske. So basically Heuske. It's not that tricky actually. The only problem for a lot of um, uh, people that, uh, that, that come from countries near the Mediterranean is that they have a problem with the starting age. So because it's, it's actually, you, you actually hear it, yeah? Heuske. And what also keeps, uh, what also makes a lot of people stumble is those weird characters in there. So, again, I'm going to um, do something similar than what I did last time. I have my whiteboard here again. Only this time I'm not going to draw graphs on it, but instead I'm writing on it. So, first of all, how is my name written? There we have it. Uh, ugh, everything is the other way around. Um, Heuske. Yeah? So we have an umlaut A here. And the B, which is not a B actually. If you um, translate this name thingy into ASCII characters only, what you would get as a proper version is this. So the A umlaut thingy becomes an AE. And the thing that looks like a B um, is actually an S, or rather a very sharp S. Which brings me to the SZ, which uh, I think is not very present around the world, uh, only in German, German, Austrian, uh, maybe some other very weird languages. But um, it's it's something unique, as in it, it also is, is a letter that is only available in the lower case, so there is no official uppercase of it. And um, while it may look like a B, if you write it like this, which is actually a bit wonky, let me rewrite it, because now it looked like a beta. If you write it like this, yes, it looks like an uppercase B, but trust me, it is an S. And it also actually does look like an S if one takes a look at how Germans used to write about 100 years ago, um, because there used, uh, used to be this different kind of lettering called Fraktur, uh, and uh, that actually had two, two versions of a lowercase s. Um, one being the one that you know, uh, which was um, a s, so a very, um, I don't know how to say that, so more, more s and not a z, yeah? So, and the other one, the z, um, looked like that. So basically an f without the middle thingy. So, um, so this is also an S, even if it may not look like that. And then there also was a different way to write the Z. So this old way to write the Z looks more like a weird three. And what you, what you can do now, and maybe you're already seeing it, if you put those two things together and write them a bit, little bit closer, they are starting to look a bit like that one. And this is basically what this one is, because this one is an SZ. At least it's called like that, written 
without the actual uh, ligature, it's like that, double S. Um, so that would be that. Um, again, my name is Heuske. And uh, someone in the chat just cried, it's not a beta. No, it's not a beta. It doesn't have anything to do with a B. It's indeed an S and a very sharp one. Um, Funnily enough, that thing even has an, uh, that, that, that letter even has its own Wikipedia entry, as I checked earlier today. Uh, and there it is also again explained where it comes from and why it is actually an SZ and why there is no uppercase version, because for us in, in German language, it is never occurs at the beginning of a word. So there was no need to have an uppercase version of that, um, of that letter. And, uh, yeah, the, the article was very interesting. I never read it before. So um, if you are interested at all in, in how weird stuff like those letters come to li come to life, this would be something interesting. Um, if you want to type it on an US keyboard, I think you have to hit Alt and S or Alt Gr and S. I don't know exactly. On the German one, it's well, the German keyboard looks completely different than the US keyboard. Anyhow, um, on the German keyboard, it's reached by typing alt gr and uh, the one uh, key next to the zero and um, if that now makes you cringe a bit because i have to hit special keys every time that i want to write my name properly yeah that this is a bit weird um don't get me started on how bad for programming, which is mostly focused on where keys are on the US keyboard, uh, how, how much uh, finger wrangling that can be on a German keyboard. Still, I learned typing on that one. Uh, not touch typing, but I'm still very fast, like, like 10 finger uh, blind, uh, looking at away from the screen fast. Um, and I couldn't work on, on, on US, I think. Maybe a bit, give me a bit of, of, of uh, adjustment, but um, yeah. So this is how Heuske is pronounced. And I hope that helped you a lot. If you ever want to try to say this name in public, I don't know why would you would need to do this, but still now, you know, um, first name Gina, by the way, but I think this one is not as problematic. Do I have uh, something more to say about this stuff? I don't think so. No more questions in the chat, I think. Well, in that case, I guess we could call it a day. Yeah, still nothing in the chat. Um, then um, the next uh, the next hangout broadcast kind of thingy will be somewhere within the next four to five weeks. I don't know exactly when yet because I first have to take a look at my calendar. Uh, what what is uh, upcoming the next weekends? In any case, I this time I will not um, pre decide the time when we, when it will happen, but uh, we will do uh, a when is good survey again like we did for the second one. So I'm basically trying to do this. So one in the in the evening hours my time one decided by everyone who wants to vote basically and the third one in my morning hours so that I hopefully get everyone a chance to join um, regardless of where they are located on the world. Um, this, uh, uh, the recording of, of this broadcast, uh, I'll probably get around to making public next week. Um, until then, you already should be able to watch it, though, uh, by just clicking again on the event link. Um, I just need first to, to have find some time to, to make this, this, little, um, this little jump mark listing again about the topics that we talked about here. So uh, I will not immediately publish it now, which makes you a bit of an, of an elite group until then, <laughs> anyway. Um, that would be it, I think. Then um, thanks for joining everyone who joined and uh, thanks for watching everyone who watched these, uh, this recording afterwards. And I hope it was entertaining and you learned something and you also got a feeling of where the Octoprint development is currently going and where I'm stuck on stupid cookies. 
And uh, I hope you have a good rest of the day, evening, afternoon, morning, whatever it may be, and a nice rest of the weekend. So thanks for your time and bye.